And we continue our discussion with uh, Anthony Markham, a fellow for the Governance Project at the R Street Institute. One of the things that you wrote here, and I'll just uh, quote, a legislature that has deprioritized legislating may seem haphazard, but it is regrettably deliberate. Delegating political responsibility is good business, especially in the endless campaign cycle Washington has embraced. There is plenty of credit in naming and confirming judges with little responsibility for their subsequent decisions. This is an attitude that extends beyond just the uh, confirming of judges. It also extends to, uh, for example, uh, things like uh, military base closures, uh, pay raises for Congress, and, of course, one of their all-time favorites, delegating congressional authority to unelected bureaucrats at the various three-letter regulatory agencies, which I would argue is patently unconstitutional. Congress may not abdicate such responsibility. And that uh, if uh, we ever found, of course, people with standing, apparently uh, being a voter, a taxpayer, and a citizen doesn't count, but if we ever found people with standing to bring such a case, I don't see how the court could rule otherwise that it is unconstitutional for Congress to be abdicating such responsibilities. And I'd like your thoughts. Well, I think you're right there um, with a lot of conservative legal experts who similarly argue that this sort of congressional delegation to the three-letter agencies um, in the executive branch is an unconstitutional delegation of power, and in a way also gives the executive branch far more power than they can constitutionally should have. And this isn't just an arbitrary exercise in who does what. This is actually important for our separation of powers. It doesn't matter who the president is. It's in our interest, um, either um, as citizens or as people who vote for representatives to represent them in a legislature to make sure that our direct representatives have power, access, and institutional control over what happens in this country. When it just goes to one executive that's elected every four years in comparison to senators and, mem- and uh, members of the House who are elected more often, of course the senators have six years, but in the House have two, um, there's this sort of democracy problem that you see and this sort of delegation problem that is becoming all the more alarming, especially as the federal government grows and uh, has nearly every single um, interest and in policy in every single corner of society in our lives. More to come, one eight six six five zero jimbo our number, one eight six six five zero five four six two six. Are you happy with what the judiciary is doing? We'll continue with Anthony Markham, a fellow for the Governance Project at the R Street Institute. Welcome back to Jimbo Hannah Show, one eight six six five zero jimbo one eight six six five zero five four six two six. Anthony Markham is our guest. He's a fellow for the Governance Project at the R Street Institute, and we're looking at the politicizing of America's judiciary. Is this as much a problem at the uh, state and local level? I would assume not. Well, I don't think it's necessarily as much of a problem at the state and local level. One of the curious differences in many states, of course, from the federal judiciary, is that many of these seats are elected. Um, some see that as more of a direct way to elect judges and keep them more politically accountable. On the other hand, you have some argue that this is a way that makes the judiciary even seem more politicized. And you see this experiment in different states with probably mixed results. But at, at the state courts, it's also interesting because – and this was a book written not long ago by a circuit court judge um, making the argument, look, everyone thinks of the United States Supreme Court as constitutional law. But we also have 50 other constitutions, state constitutions, and people can also consider those constitutions and how that law affects their everyday lives. So one of the biggest ways to make change is not necessarily go through the federal courts, go up to the Supreme Court and hope for the best, is to go through your own state and own communities to try to enact some change, whether that's legally or in the ballot box. Uh, well, we can, we can hope that uh, something in that direction may, uh, may follow through. Uh, I'm wondering your thoughts – about uh, the future. Are you an optimist? I try to be an optimist, and I really am an optimist. I I do think that there is a growing, and I think this term is very indicative of that, a growing frustration with the courts. And and kind of hear me out, I think that's a good thing, because I think if you have this growing, almost bipartisan frustration, I'm cautiously optimistic there's going to be less political reliance on them. And when there's less political reliance on things that aren't political, then the things that are inherently political, like our legislature, as it should be, can start making more political decisions for themselves. 
But if they've already learned that the safest course of action is to avoid the hot potatoes and to defer their powers and just uh, uh, keep uh, getting reelected, uh, I'm not sure if they have uh, the motivation to do what you just said. Well, I, and again, I, it, this isn't something that's going to be solved overnight, but I think it's going to be something solved when voters keep politicians accountable for the decisions that they are obligated to make. And if the courts aren't going to make those decisions for them, and if we're able to rein in a growing executive branch, then we have the politics and direct politics exactly right where they want, where we need them in the legislature. And in a way, we're going to keep politicians and those we vote for every every cycle more accountable. And yet, of course, uh, most voters uh, don't pay attention to what we're talking about, as is evidenced by the fact that, in my view, and I suspect yours, there have been few who have strayed uh, further from the U.S. Constitution in recent years than Nancy Pelosi. And yet, of her last five elections in her district, which is essentially the city of San Francisco, the lowest vote total she ever got in November was 80 percent. The others were in the 80s. So it's not as though the voters are inclined to hold people accountable. Uh, For far too many voters out there, the litmus test of how I cast my vote is who gives me the most free stuff. And she wins that one hands down. Well, of course, course I think you're going to see in overwhelmingly liberal districts, overwhelmingly liberal candidates getting overwhelming results. I think that's, that's something nothing new in our history. Um, we, the certain political pockets of the country have received similar unanimous support for decades on time. What is new, however, is this sort of reliance on not the politicians, but the regulators and the judges. And I think that is something can change just as quickly as it happened. So it might take some time. I'm cautiously optimistic we can return to a system that's more familiar to our founders. Uh, one one could hope that that would would be the case. I'm wondering your thoughts about an Article 5 Constitutional Convention of the States. There are some things, such as, for example, term limits for Congress, that I don't think will happen any other way. I, I, you know, of course, that's something that's been proposed and suggested for quite some time. When it comes to term limits themselves, I've thought about this, and I'm a little dubious of term limits. I think the intention is good. I think to have the idea of a term limit for a Supreme Court justice for uh, for example, is a thoughtful idea, and I think it comes from a good place. We want to see turnover. We don't want to see judges serving on the court for decades. But I think in the long run, the the way it's structured now, and I tend to agree with Hamilton a lot, and this one I also do, is it creates a certain insular protection from political influence. There's a lot of political bullying that happens often from the left trying to bully um, certain moderate and center-right judges to rule certain ways. I think that would get even worse with term limits. Also, I think it's a way, if they're term limited, they need to think about what's next. And if they need to think about what's next, sometimes it impacts their decisions on what's happening now. Uh, certainly, again, uh, we, can, we can hope to see that, uh, that some change will take place, but it will require a public that, uh, that deeply cares. And it's hard for a public to deeply care when, frankly, we don't even teach what used to be called civics anymore. How many people out there, I mean, when you've got... Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez unable to name the three branches of government, and she's in one of them. Uh, what does that say about the electorate? Well, you would hope by accident, if you if you cut one down, you'd be able to narrow down the other two. But I, uh, I you know, again, I, I'm hopeful. I, I think it's going to take an effort. It's going to take a very conscious effort to promote civics, to promote responsibility. I think it was fantastic we had a caller call in and talk about studying for the Americanism test for his citizenship. And I think that's an important thing to be cognizant of our country, what the ideals of our country were, and to look at the system of our country and why the the structure that was chosen and what was happening at the time to protect against abuses by a monarch, to make sure people had democratically elected representatives to represent them in a legislature. I think that can only help us and restore our system. All right. Stay on the line. We'll speak off air. Anthony Markham, fellow for the Governance Project at rstreet.org. Welcome back to the Jim Bohannon Show. We're talking to Anthony Markham. He is a fellow at the Governance Project of the R Street Institute. one 866 jimbo is our number. We're looking at politics, getting mixed in with the courts, and talking with the Todd in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. Hello, Todd. Hey, Jimbo. Thanks for taking my call. And the first thing I want to say is you are the most gracious 
post ever. Uh, now, uh, and that's coming off your last hour. But now to your guest now, and I want to point out, you brought up the Constitution. The Constitution has very, very limited powers upon everything. In fact, uh, if you really read the details, the federal government is only supposed to uh, facilitate interstate trade and protect the borders. Well, it goes a little beyond that, but it does have uh, greater limitations at the time it was written than it has uh, developed today. It goes way beyond those two things, but go ahead. In, indeed, indeed. And, but the, uh, the the situation with the courts uh, was meant to be to originally make judgment upon the the federal situation, but the court system has grown so vast, like a spider's web. And the fact that we can have uh, court districts in California and in New York making judgments of the federal government just drives me crazy, and I want to leave that to your guests. Okay, very good. Uh, Anthony? No, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate the question. I think what Todd is referring to is you can have, you can have district courts in Texas and California often do nationwide injunctions. Certain parties have the ability to file lawsuits in certain federal courts in the country and have the ability often to get stays or to have one federal judge have an injunction and stop an entire federal program or policy or an executive branch action. Yeah. And I must confess, of, I've never been quite sure where that power is derived from. Well, well uh, you know, there's, there's a very curious evolution of it, and I think people get more and more frustrated as we saw it increasing during the Obama administration and even more now during the Trump administration. And I think, and I think uh, you raised a really good point earlier in the hour. Go back to Article 3. Look at all those powers Congress has. If Congress wants to address this, they very much can. There have been, of course, hearings and talks and rumblings about it, but Congress can go further than that, and Congress can actually tackle issues like that, which in the end I think would benefit any presidential administration. It helps lessen the politics of the court a bit, whether that president is a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, do you see any, any sign of that changing? I, you know, of course I don't see it changing now and one of the things is we have a divided congress i don't know if it's going to take a congress of one party and a president of another or some sort of negotiation i'm I'm skeptical at the moment but i'm hopeful as this becomes more and more common there reaches a boiling point where regardless of what party you are there's a frustration with this this sort of geographic you know if the case doesn't concern california or maybe if it's nationwide why do they have the power to enforce one particular law or ruling across the country if you're in the Central District of California, I can see the argument. Your ruling should apply to the Central District of California, not to Arkansas, Florida, Maine, or somewhere else. All right. Uh, next up is uh, Doug in uh, Avon, Minnesota, on the Jim Bohannon Show with our guest, Anthony Markham. Hello, Doug. Good evening. Your last caller and your last conversation here in just the last 30 seconds or so leads into my question. If at some point, regardless of political party, whether it be Democrat or Republican, you mentioned the Constitution having very small limitations on the courts. If the political party of one side or the other ever fell into a majority with both House, Senate, and Presidential, could at that point the Congress step in and thus limit the number of judges, the stop some of the activism that's going on and just bring things back more in line with what the Constitution was intended for? Well, we've had uh, such a circumstance, and, and, and in fact, it, it hasn't happened. But, I mean, uh, theoretically, I suppose what, what Congress could do, which it says in the Constitution, is to simply abolish certain district uh, courts or certain appellate courts at the federal level. Uh, Anthony? Sure. I mean, of course, that's something Congress has the power to do. From a capacity standpoint, these are my concerns, especially at the lower district courts. Ninety-nine percent of what the district courts and even the circuit courts handle are really non-controversial. A lot of it is um, a dispute between two small businesses, a contract um, dispute between two companies maybe in different parts of the country, a federal prisoner trying to write a petition, um, someone trying to get their Social Security benefits. So my fear is if we just start slashing judgeship, we're really not going to get these cases resolved for the vast majority of people that really need resolution in federal court. On the other hand, something that can be looked at is jurisdiction limits. 
um, again, nationwide injunctions, some of the more nuanced things we can do. And in fact, I would make the argument we actually need more judgeships to handle these capacity issues. There hasn't been a significant judgeship bill in the United States since 1990. We're 30 years now since actually adding significant judgeships in the country, and the population has increased, caseloads have increased, and a lot of parts of the country, courts are actually struggling to get people their day in court. one 560 jimbo our number one 560 We have some more thoughts about this whole nation a notion, I should say, of uh, politics and the courts in our country. We are speaking with uh, Anthony Markham. He is a fellow for the Governance Project at the R Street Institute. Their web street is, uh, their website is the website uh, rstreet.org, R-S-T-R-E-E-T 